Welcome to the sixth class of our journey through the book of Revelation. We're studying all 404 verses over 20 class periods. And we've gotten to uh, the middle section of the churches, which is kind of a strange title. You can see it there on the slide in front of you. Don't get to heaven empty handed. And of course, the picture, if you can make it out, is a picture of Samson, the Old Testament judge, pushing down the pillars of the temple of the Philistines and uh, going down into uh, death with thousands of Philistines, with the enemies of God. But the real message is not an Old Testament uh, Bible story. It's the fact that today we're going to look at these three churches and we've lumped them together because all three of these churches have the same warning. It's the warning from 1 Corinthians 3.15. It said that some people there in that scripture will get to heaven yet so as by fire. They will suffer loss. In fact, Job 19 and verse 20 says, they get to heaven by the skin of their teeth. Now, my teeth don't have skin. And that is an expression from old times saying you just barely make it. Paul said you make it so as by fire. It's like you made it through the fire. But that's all. You just made it. You are getting to heaven empty handed. To the greatest reception of all times, to the greatest uh, time to give a gift to the one that did more for you than anyone else and more for me, Jesus Christ. We have been invited to a banquet where we present a gift to him. And there are going to actually be people who get there to that banquet empty handed. That's a very sobering message. Another way to look at it, to give a book of Revelation framework to it is why some believers suffer loss at the Bema throne. I'm going to read one verse and then pray that the Lord, and it's, uh, if you want to look it up, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 3, the one I already uh, quoted to you, and verse 15. And I'm going to pray that the Lord will use his word to speak to our hearts in a way that for some of us, we've never heard this message in this way before. This is what God says, Paul's epistle to the Corinthians, chapter 3, verse, I'll start actually in verse 13. Each one's works will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on endures, he will receive a reward. So look up here. He won't be empty handed. Now look at verse 15. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Suffer loss, still be saved, so as through fire. How to get to heaven empty handed. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Lord, I pray that this class will be a unique uh, ministry in many lives of getting some believers uh, serious about why they're even here, what you left us to do, and how there is a reckoning for how we invest our 24 hours a day, 168 hours a week, that river of time flowing past us at 60 minutes an hour. You've asked us to redeem it. And Lord, I pray that, that many of your children, believers that are listening and watching this class will start thinking about what they're doing with their time, how they're actually wasting great amounts of their life from your perspective. And your perspective is all that matters. I pray that would come through to our hearts. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, what we're looking at on this slide, you can see is uh, living for God in a very dangerous world. Uh, remember, these churches that this letter is written to were living in the second generation of the first church that was born on the day of Pentecost. And this second generation church had this book. They had the whole Bible except for this last book, Revelation. 
and that's what's coming to them. And God says, you're living in a very dangerous world, and I want you to survive that very dangerous world. I want you to know me. And that's basically the outline of the book of Revelation. In this class, we're still here in the very first section. Chapters 1 through 3 are all directed toward and illustrating the church on earth. Then we see in 4 and 5 the church in heaven, the great tribulation, the second coming of Christ, his millennial rule, the ending of that with the great white throne, and then, of course, dwelling in heaven. We've come on this map to the third, fourth, and fifth churches. You see, Ephesus would be, if this was a, a clock on the wall with uh, numbers on it, it would be at about uh, 9 o'clock. And then Smyrna would be at about 10 o'clock, and Pergamos would be at about noon, and Thyatira would be at 2, and Sardis at 3, if that was a clock face. So we've come on the geography uh, of the book of Revelation from the first to the second to this grouping. The, the overcomfortable with sin, the infected with sin, and the stupefied acting like they're not even alive church. And again, on this chart, this portrays what I've showed you over and over again, the seven types of believers. Distracted believers, Ephesus. Refined believers by suffering, Smyrna. Pergamus had the compromised believers, the ones who were comfortable around sin. Thyatira had the deceived believers. They are deceived. They think that they can live their life any way they want. They that they don't have to be aware of sin. And then the Sardis believers, they're stupefied. They're, they act dead like they're not even Christians. And then we have, and we'll come to the Philadelphians, the dedicated Christians, and then of course these uncommitted blinded ones. Uh, let's begin with Pergamum, and that's in chapter 2, verse 12. And we're actually going to walk through the text, and I'm going to point out the structure I've already told you about, uh, but the lesson that we're going to see is this. The third church in Revelation 2, starting in verse 12, the church at Pergamum, remember that's a literal uh, location that's still, uh, uh, that you could visit in Turkey today. In fact, uh, many years ago, Bonnie and I led a tour and we took a bus from a cruise boat and went up to see this church at Pergamus. But the lesson is beware of secret sins. And here on the slide in front of you, Pergamum is all about when believers compromise Christ's call to personal holiness. Now see, that's what we're getting into here. Uh, the Lord, everyone that he saves, he sanctifies. Uh, the evidence of salvation is that all who God justifies, and that's the way God describes salvation. Justification is the doctrine where my sins go on Christ and his righteousness comes on me. All who are justified, Paul says in Romans chapter 8, are also sanctified. It's uh, like if we took a coin out of our pocket, and if you looked at one side and saw in the American Quarter, George Washington, you'd have to flip it over, and if it doesn't have the eagle on the back, you know that it's not a real quarter, that it's just a, a kind of like a, um, a fake one, one that's used maybe for uh, playing over and over a game that would slide through, but it's not the two-sided, it's a counterfeit. The Lord says, all who are justified are sanctified. The problem with Pergamos is they compromised that element and they were not living sanctified lives. Let's, let's read, starting in verse 12. And to the angel, and I've said this at every class, the angel, Angelos, is messenger. Uh, a messenger from God uh, was an angel as we think of it, but it doesn't mean that you have to have an angel every time you have a messenger. There were earthly messengers, and that's what the pastor of this church was. And so the pastor, the messenger, the one who spoke for God to the church of Pergamos, right? Verse 12 continues, These things says he who has the sharp sword with two edges. Now again, back to chapter 1. That's a reference to Jesus Christ as he was portrayed in chapter 1. Verse 13, I know your works and where you dwell 
even where Satan's seat is. And you hold fast my name and have not denied my faith, even in the days when Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was slain among you where Satan dwells. Now, I've already told you that, that in the city of Pergamos, Satan seems to have set up his headquarters. So he says, I know that you're, you're living near Satan's headquarters. Now, Satan's headquarters are kind of like living near uh, a paper mill. You ever live by a paper mill? You know, kind of down on I-40 in the south? You can smell them miles away. Have you ever lived near the sewer plant? Have you ever lived near anything that emits something that is nauseous or dangerous? Well, can you imagine what was coming out of Satan's headquarters? So the Lord's commanding him. He says, you've been living where Satan's seat is, and you've held fast. Now, look at verse 14. But I have a few things against you. Yes, you survived living near Satan's headquarters. But what's happened is your compromised immunity system. You have been around that horrible, powerful, dark, uh, debilitating radiation of Satan, and it's affected your personal sanctification. What was that? I have a few things against you because there, you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, to commit fornication. Now, this is going back to the Old Testament story of the children of Israel that were tempted by Balak getting all of the worship of the Midianites into and destroying the people of Israel. And he doesn't stop there. So they had that problem. But look at verse 15. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which things I hate. Now, this is another uh, old um, struggle in the church. Nicolaitans, Nicolaitans. Uh, is Nike, the Greek word, Laos, the, the victory uh, of the people. And it's, it's like, you know, like Nike now is a famous uh, sports brand, a shoe brand, an athletic apparel maker. But Nike, the, the Greek word, is victory. And it, when it's connected with people, it's victory of the people. So there were, in this church, there were kind of like these people that were dominating the church. Nicolaitans were a cult that had come into the church and was dominating the church. And, and the Lord says, see in verse 15, I hate that. But look at verse 16. Repent or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. That's very interesting. Come to you, fight against them. What's, what's going on here? Well, the people that were receptive to the letter that was being written by Jesus to this church, there were within the church, so this is the church, there were those who were receptive. They're actually listening. They have ears. They're, they're sanctified. Then there are those who are who have compromised. So within the church, the, the ones who weren't being sanctified, who were compromised, the Lord says, I'm going to fight against them. And those of you who are receptive, hear what I have to say. See, within every church, we have those who love the Lord, but they're distracted. Those who love the Lord, but they're suffering uh, persecution. And then we have those that are comfortable with sin, infected with sin, uh, actually acting like they're lost people. Then we have those that are completely doing what the Lord says. Those are the ones that have ears to hear. Those are the ones who are justified and sanctified. Then we have these compromised believers who are going to get to heaven and they're going to suffer loss. And to all, Jesus said, repent or I'll come to you quickly and fight against you with the sword of my mouth. Now look at verse 17. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Remember, the receptive have ears. And what he's doing is he's talking to the whole church, but some won't listen. And that's the danger. But to those who overcome, to those who are justified and sanctified, those who have ears to hear and are receptive to the Word of God, those who repent, look what he offers. 
To those that overcome, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat. I will give them a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. The closest thing in our, t our current culture to this white stone with a new name written would be when you get your ATM card, you get a PIN. The ATM card doesn't work unless you have the PIN, the secret code. What the Lord says is, I'm giving you a treasure that you have personal access to. Just like that ATM card works in any ATM machine as long as you have the PIN, Jesus said, what I give to you works anywhere as long as you follow my word, my commandment, as long as you live my way, as long as you are my children. Well, Pergamum had a problem. They dwelt, as verse 13 says, where Satan dwelt. They had this, this horrible problem of living in the presence of sin. Now, let me show you uh, what the Lord says that we're always to do when we live in the presence of sin. All of us live in the presence of sin somewhere. And the Lord's goal for us is he wants to sanctify us. Now, this, there are two passages that deal with how the Lord wants to sanctify us. The first one we'll look at is in Ephesians 4. And I alluded to it uh, yesterday in one of our earlier classes. But look at the book of Ephesians, 1 Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, chapter 4, starting in verse 22. And this is one of the more famous descriptors that Paul taught about how the early church was to live around sin. It says in verse 22, and that you put off concerning your form of conduct, the old man which grows corrupt according to deceitful lust. Verse 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Verse 24, put on the new man which is created in righteousness. Put off, be renewed, put on. So put off, there are things every day in our lives we need to put off. Then we get into the word and get renewed. We ask God to renew our minds like Romans 12, 1 and 2, by the renewing of your mind, you may prove what is that good. And then we put on. So basically the Christian life is putting off something, being renewed on the operating system and putting on something. So much like getting ready in the morning. You get up, you, you take off your dirty clothes, you jump in the shower, you put on your clean clothes. Now that's simple. What happens to someone that doesn't put off their dirty clothes and doesn't take a shower and doesn't put on their new clothes? Well, if you sit by them in class, you start noticing and you start going, something wrong? What is that? You see, when we don't follow the basic sanctification steps, the odor of our life begins to betray the fact that we're living not like a new creation in Christ. And sooner or later, our mind starts thinking that mm, the Bible's too hard to read. I don't get anything out of it. And pretty soon we start feeling like an unsaved person. I was a pastor for decades in America, uh, started in, in Georgia, uh, continued from there uh, to South Carolina, then I went to California, then I went to Rhode Island, then I went to Oklahoma and ended up finishing my pastoral years in Michigan. Do you know what the most common question that people, they would make an appointment, come to my office, and they'd say, I have a Bible question. And finally, when the door shut, they'd look at me and they say, I don't feel like I'm saved. I go, oh, well, was there ever a time you were saved? Oh, yes. I said, so if you're really saved, you can't lose your salvation. What you're telling me is you don't feel saved now. And that's what it was. And do you know what it was? There were always, 100% of the time, there were things that gradually came back from their old life. They wouldn't put off. Their mind got confused. They weren't renewed. They weren't putting on the helmet of salvation. So they didn't even feel like a Christian. That's what was going on in the church in Pergamos. What did Paul say in Titus 2, 11, 12, and 13? He said this, For the grace of God that brings salvation. So the justifying work 
of Christ opens for me the sanctifying life of Christ. The grace of God that brings salvation teaches us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, godly. Soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Putting off, being renewed, putting on. How? The grace of God. The same grace that brought us salvation teaches us to deny ungodliness. Justification is salvation brought to us. Sanctification is denying ungodliness. What happens to people who are saved that don't do that? They get to heaven empty-handed. Very sobering message. Well, let's move on to the second church, because remember I told you all three churches have the same struggle. And I would like to start in verse 18 of chapter 2, and look at how Jesus searches our hearts and minds. He's looking at the churches one by one, and he's writing them a letter with his diagnosis after spending time looking at them. Uh, starting in verse 18, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira, write, these things says the Son of God, now look at this, that has eyes like a flame of fire. Do you see he's searching? What Jesus is saying is, I have laser-like eyes. I was reading in uh, New York Times about a new acquisition that the U.S. Army, the Marines, uh, our military is getting, where the soldiers can actually wear a device where through thermal imaging and I don't know what else, they can actually see the movement of people through walls. Wow. I mean, it kind of sounds like superhero stuff. But scientifically, there's some device you can wear that can, can read the signature of, of body heat or something, and they can actually, through thermal imaging, see the occupants inside the room. Wow, that's really neat. Jesus says, hey, I've always had that. I can see, not through the walls, I can see what you're thinking. I can see what you're feeling. I have eyes, look what it says in verse 18, like a flame of fire. And my feet are like fine brass. What is this brass? This is speaking of what I was talking to you about earlier, in an earlier class, the chastening or the disciplining or the spanking of God, he does not allow us to continue in sin. And he said, my feet are like fine brass. I know your works, verse 19, your love, service, faith, and your patience. And as for your works, the last are more than the first. So in Thyatira, he says, those of you that, that are justified and sanctified, I'm watching you. But now, look at his condemnation. Verse 20, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You allow that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit sexual immorality and to eat things sacrificed to idols. They were not just comfortable around sin. They were engaging in sin. Now, for me, um, I get notifications uh, and, and notes from people who are watching these classes on YouTube. And I told my wonderful wife, Bonnie, uh, who distracts me all the time in this class, she's at, actually sitting out there, and she's the one person in the whole world I'd like to spend all my time with, and when I, I have to not look at her too much or I'll get off target. But I got an, a note this morning from a fellow that said, I've come to know the Lord. I fell away, I got involved in drinking, and got involved in drugs, and the Lord has taken those out of my life, but I'm still struggling for the, last, the past year and a half with the same thing as verse 20. I'm committing sexual immorality, and I'm compromised. This one, this fellow that wrote to me said, <coughs> excuse me, he said, I am struggling with putting off, with being renewed, with putting on. And he said, I know I'm justified, but my problem is the sanctifying work. And I said, well, 
what you're experiencing. He told me about all these struggles he's having in his life. As I said, the Lord is chastening you, disciplining you. He's spanking you so that you will take his grace and deny ungodliness, put it off and say no. See, the grace of God opens the prison door. We're not locked into our temptations and sins anymore. We can forcibly say no and depart. As the Lord says, let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Look at verse 22. What happens if we don't repent, as verse 21 talks about? Well, the chastening, the discipline that God has is severe. Verse 22. Indeed, I will cast her, that's this false teacher, into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent. And verse 23. I will kill her children with death. Oh, you know what 1 Corinthians 11 says? From verse 23 all the way down through verse 27. It says, those who partake of the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner, if they do not repent of sin, will become weak from their disobedience. If they still do not repent, they will become sick. And if they still do not repent, the same thing as in verse 23. They will die. I will kill, verse 23, her children with death. And the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your works. Now continue to verse 24. Now to you, I say, and to the rest in Thyatira, as many as do not have this doctrine, who have not known the depths of Satan. Now remember, each of these letters are saying that within the church, there seem to have been those who were actually living out the sanctified life, and then there are those that are compromised. And you see him speaking to both halves of the church. As many as have not this doctrine, they're the ones who are not being involved with Jezebel and her fornication and immorality. And to this group, those that are, he says, I want you, I want you to repent. And then he continues in verse 24. Uh, As they say, I will put on you no other burden, but look at verse 25, but hold fast what you have till I come. And he who overcomes and keeps my works to the end, to him I will give power of the nations. This is a future promise of, of serving the Lord. Um, he will rule them with a rod of iron. They shall be dashed in pieces like the potter's vessels. As also I received from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. So Jesus is saying, as he said to his disciples, remember, uh, I've told you often, there's nothing new in the book of Revelation. And as Jesus told the disciples that they would sit on 12 thrones, Jesus is saying, we also will help him in the millennial kingdom. After we're in heaven, we will come back and be his servants, much as we have seen others that come Uh, like Moses and Elijah during the ministry of Christ. And then look how verse 29 ends. I have a box around it on the slide there. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The Lord is saying, true believers, those who have been justified and sanctified, they will hear and they will respond. Now look at the next slide, because God sent more New Testament letters here to Thyatira than anywhere else. Let let me explain what I mean. There are actually, and if you had, uh, if if I could draw a map of Asia Minor right here, and it's pretty busy right now, I can't put it in there, but if if I did, these are the letters that would have, here, I'll put a little one. This is the Roman province of Asia Minor, and here is Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardius, Philadelphia, Laodicea. That part of modern day Turkey, listen how many letters were written, especially to that area. Peter wrote his epistles, two of them. You know how the the book of 1 Peter starts? To the elect scattered throughout Pontus, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. So Peter wrote two letters here. Now, of course, Revelation was written to here. So Revelation, 1 Peter, 2 Peter. So we have three letters coming there. 
Paul wrote his letter to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, and the Colossians. Uh, the Galatians lived here. The Ephesians lived here. The Colossians lived there. So Galatians, Ephesians, and Colossians. Then Timothy. Timothy, 1st and 2nd Timothy, so 1st and 2nd Timothy, Timothy was the pastor right there at Ephesus. So we've got eight letters written to this little area. John the Apostle pastored in Ephesus right here and wrote back to that church, 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John. And then, finally, the first New Testament book. Remember what the first New Testament book is? James, servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Greetings. The 12 tribes were scattered throughout this area. So the book of James actually was written from Jerusalem to here, which makes the 12th. More books of the Bible were written to that little part, modern day Turkey, than any other place in the world. And the books all all of these books, Revelation and, and Paul's epistles to the Ephesians and the Colossians, all of these, 1st, 2nd Timothy, all of those books have the same message. Daily choice that we each have, serve Christ or not. Thyatira was being seduced by the false teacher Jezebel as true believers in that church were called on Christ to resist evil speaking and evil lifestyles. What I'm saying is what they were facing in Turkey is the same challenge you and I face every day. Serve Christ or not. Let the justifying death of Christ open for us the sanctifying life of Christ. That's a choice every day that we make. They were living in hard times. This is the longest of the seven letters starting in verse 18. Thyatira was the least known of all the churches that got the longest letter. Now, what we do know, there's only one thing we really know about this church. In Acts 16, when Paul's first European convert was saved, if you remember, Lydia, she was a merchant from where? Thyatira. That's the only thing we know about this church. That Paul's first convert in that meeting in, in, uh, Philipp in, in uh, Philippi was a woman from Thyatira. Probably she went back to this city and shared the gospel. But what she brought with her is what the scripture said, that it's a daily choice to serve Christ or not. Uh, Lydia, the Lord opened her heart and she went back there, took the gospel, most likely to Thyatira. A church was born. She was wealthy. Probably she funded it. But Let's just talk about what Thyatira looked like. Now, the one thing we do know is archaeologists have spent their time finding all seven of these churches. And this church in Thyatira, an extensive excavation was done by a British archaeologist named Sir William Ramsey. And I'll, I'll read to you what was going on. The saints in Thyatira, he wrote, needed to stop their friendship with the world because it was displeasing to God. Most workers in Thyatira were members of guilds. Now, we would call that a union, kind of like a teacher's union or an auto worker's union uh, or the Teamsters or something like that. Most people who lived in Thyatira lived in this Roman area that had trade guilds. The guilds encouraged their members by setting prices for their labor and the prices on the goods they sold. That meant that all the various trades, the potters, the dyers, the tanners, the bakers, the metal workers, the textile makers, the bronze smiths, the slave dealers, the leather workers, and all the rest had guilds in this town. But Ramsey wrote this after actually digging that town up. He said this, sin was everywhere present and powerfully alluring. Quote, revelry, license, intoxication, marked the pagan religious trade guilds. Lounging on dining couches, surrounded by troops of unclothed dancing and singing slaves, was fatal to all self-restraining spirits. In other words, the guilds held weekly meetings where they fed, fed, 
and gave alcohol to all the employees. And the alcohol was served by basically unclothed female slaves who would give you as much as you wanted to drink, as much as you wanted to eat, and as much as you wanted of anything else. Therefore, these justified, sanctified people were getting comfortable and gradually involved in sin. And what happened is Jezebel, this woman prophet, says, hey, it's okay. It's part of work. And kind of telling the Christians and excusing it. Well, what we could say is they were living in a cesspool of sin. Now, that's an old-fashioned word. Cesspool is septic tank. We don't even have those anymore because we have public sewers. It's where everything flushed in the toilet goes into this pond. It's called a cesspool, sewer. Do you know what living in Pergamos, Thyatira, and Sardis was like? It was much like a surgeon friend of mine that talked about doing colon surgery. He said, imagine cutting your finger open, having it bleeding, and sticking it into a dirty diaper and using that as the bandage. He says, how, how much do you think that'll heal? Well, how much do you think a justified, sanctified person living in that Thyatira and cesspool could live? Wives knew that every month their husbands were going off to a guild meeting, knowing he was served all the alcohol he could ever drink, followed by a pornographic strip show. Well, the next slide, Christ's call to holiness has never changed. Christ called them to do what all these 12 letters said they were supposed to do. They were supposed to put off Ephesians 4.22, be renewed Ephesians 4.23, put on Ephesians 4.24. They were supposed to deny ungodliness, Titus 2.11. They were supposed to know that if they come to the Lord's table unrepentant of sin, the Lord would chasten them, make them weak and sick. They were under God's chastening. But Christ's call to holiness is to live in the presence, the present time, based on the past. Now, let me, let me find a little area I can write on, because what everything in Christianity is a present action based on a past event. What's the past event? the cross of Jesus Christ. The past event is that on the cross, Jesus conquered sin. He defeated. You know what it says in Hebrews 2.14? He destroyed him that had the power of death that is the devil. Jesus conquered sin. Living in the present based on the past. How did I get saved? By trusting, believing, and clinging to the truth that Jesus died on the cross. So, in the past, Jesus died on the cross. In the present, I believe that. And that faith instantly communicates the power of the cross to my life. That's what it means to live in the present based on the past. But you know what Paul said? As you receive the Lord Jesus Christ, the way that you got salvation is the same way that you live out this sanctified life. It isn't like we got saved totally by faith, by trusting the cross of Christ, but I've got to deal with sin all on my own. I've got to work it out myself. No, the justifying death of Jesus opens for me the sanctifying life of Jesus. That's what it means to live in the present based on the past. When Jesus stood in my place and bore the punishment of God's wrath I deserved, the guiltless one took my guilt. The sinless one took my sin. The same way I was saved, believing all that took place 2,000 years ago, is exactly the same way I say no to sin. And exactly the same way that all those who trusted Christ were able to resist the allurements of Thyatira. By the way, what are the impact of chastening on a compromised worldly Thyatiran's life? Well, it says in 1 Corinthians 11 and also in Hebrews chapter 12 that God will chasten those who are not obedient to him. And those who don't repent and live lives of sanctification, the Lord will deal with them. The next slide is back to where we start in 1 Corinthians 
Samson shows us how he got to heaven empty-handed in suffering loss. Samson was one of the most amazing Old Testament personages. So many details God captures from his life to show us. Again, don't get to heaven like Samson empty-handed. How would that happen? Number one, and this is what I call the pathway or the steps on the pathway to spiritual loss. What happens when someone gets off the track of living the sanctified life? What happens when they don't live in the present based on the past work of Christ? What is chronicled happen in these three churches? Number one, like Samson, we wander away from our godly heritage. If you look in the book of Judges, chapter 13, the first 25 verses, it goes Joshua, Judges, chapter 13. I'll give you a biography of Samson. Samson was born, in verse 1, uh, into a godly family from Zorah, and he, his, uh, he was there in the family of Manoah, and his wife was barren, had no children. The Lord appeared in verse 3 and told him they'd have a child and conceived. So, so from birth, Samson was promised by God. Look what it says in verse 5. They raised him to be a Nazarite. You know what that means? He had strict rules about his life. He never cut his hair. He never was around anybody touching anything dead, and he never drank any alcohol. He was raised that way as a Nazarite. And it was promised he'd have ministry. Look at verse 8 of chapter 13. Uh, his dad prayed to the Lord and said, how do I, how do I teach uh, this boy? Uh, what, what kind of training? And he actually asked the Lord to guide. I mean, what a dad he was. He sought the Lord and prayed. And they followed what the Lord says. And then verse 18, the angel of the Lord said, Why do you ask my name, seeing it is wonderful? That's a Christophany. Chapter 13, verse 18 of Judges. Samson was unique. He was promised by God before his birth, and Christ himself came and met with his parents, telling them how to raise him. Wow. And verse 22, they were very reverent. They said, we will, we will die because we saw God. And verse 24, Samson grew and the Lord blessed him. So basically, the first 25 verses of this chapter say that Samson had a godly heritage but he wandered away from it. It starts in chapter 14, the first four verses of Judges 14, he disobeyed his parents. Remember they said, don't go down to the Philistines, don't look for a wife down there. He says, you know, bug off, I'm going to, and he did. Samson compromised his life. He begins living with uh, these different Philistine women. Uh, he, that's in chapter 14, verses five to 20. He ignores God's warning in chapter 15. Uh, Samson basically has, if you remember, he would be with all these harlots and the harlots would set him up and the Philistines would crash in and, and he would still have his strength and he'd beat up the Philistines or kill them and escape. Those were warnings from God that he neglected until finally Delilah. She seduced him and got him to tell his secret and he said, it's my hair. And while he was asleep, she cut his hair called the Philistines, and the Philistines captured him. Samson, we can say, as you see on your slide, played with sin in chapter 16, the first 20 verses, and starting in verse 21 of chapter 16, and let me read to you these very sad words. Judges 16 and verse 21. It says, Then the Philistines took him and put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza, they bound him with bronze fetters, and he became a grinder in the prison. Wow. How did all that happen? Look at the last line of verse 20. But he did not know the Lord had departed from him. There's a dreadful condition that the Bible talks about. For us as believers, the power source in our lives is the Holy Spirit. I tell young people when I teach, that's his first name, Holy. The Holy Spirit is a person. He's God the Son. Or, I mean, there's God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. He's the third person of the Trinity. Now, the scriptures say he can be grieved. How is he grieved? When we disobey the Lord, when he has to chasten us. If we continue grieving him, Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 
he can be quenched. Quenched is what I just read in verse 20. He did not know that the Lord departed. The, the power that Samson had known, that he could pick up 5,000 pound city gates that had brass on them and carry them 20 miles to the top of a mountain, that he could defeat with, with just a little stick in his hand, an entire army. It wasn't Samson. In fact, you wanna know what I think Samson looked like? He looked very much like a little skinny, nothing kid. Because it wasn't his brawn, it was the Spirit of God that made him great. But he compromised and it led to disaster. The sin that he wanted blinded him, bound him, and he started grinding. He became like an ox pulling a sledge around inside this place where they had bound him. And that became a picture, a picture of what God does with his servants who are dominated by lust, who are driven by pride and revenge. Samson defeated himself. What's amazing is Samson could defeat everyone but his own desires. Is that what God wants from us? Well, real quickly, Psalm 1611 tells us what God wants. Psalm 1611, uh, as you see on the slide, is life as God intended it to be. God wants to show us the path of life and wants us to follow his presence. And that's the choice we have to make. Well, one last church before we go, the church in Sardis. Sardis is the, and you can see it in that slide, it's the tall mountain, that's where their Acropolis was and the city spread out below it. But Sardis is all about the church where the great physician came and felt the pulse of the church. Look at Revelation chapter three and the first six verses, and he declared them to be dead. Here's a view of the, the uh, central forum area of, uh, of Sardis. But now I'd like to go through just the first few verses of Revelation chapter three before I apply it to you. It's very hard to get three churches in one class, but I'll try. It says, to the angel of the church in Sardis write, these things says he who has seven spirits of God, chapter one, verse four, the seven stars, chapter one, verse 20. Remember, all these are repeats of what Jesus said in chapter one. I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. Now look at the slide on the screen in front of you. This is Jesus quoting what he said in Isaiah. Listen to Isaiah 29, 13. This people draws near to me with their mouth and with their lips do they honor me, but they have removed their heart far from me. Isaiah 29, 13. The people of Sardis sang the same hymns, came to church and listened to the same messages, but their hearts were far from the Lord. This reminds us of what Jesus said in Luke 6, 46. He said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say? Sardis is all about Christ's call to every believer. Look what it says in the next verse, verse two. Be watchful, Revelation 3, 2, and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die, for I have not found your work perfect before God. Wow, what had happened to the people of Sardis? They had slowly fallen asleep. I don't mean sleeping through the church services, I mean, they had breathed so much of the toxic air of sin that they were in a stupor. Jesus warns in Matthew 24 of spiritual overconfidence, of, of thinking that won't happen to me. Those are famous last words. Oh, I would never do that. Do you know what the Bible says? Beware of dangerous overconfidence. That's Christ's lessons. He says, watch and pray lest you enter into what? temptation. Lest you stop putting off, stop being renewed, stop putting on, lest you stop taking the grace of God. Because what happens when we do? The Holy Spirit gets grieved. We lose the joy of our salvation. The Holy Spirit gets quenched. We lose the power of God to say no to sin. That's where they were. Paul had written an entire section on this, on spiritual watchfulness in Romans 13. Peter had said in 1 Peter 5, 8, watch out 
because your adversary, the devil, goes about like a roaring lion seeking those he can devour. Do you know what happened to these three churches? When they didn't have the Holy Spirit's power in them, when they had grieved and quenched the Spirit, Satan devoured them. What, what does that mean? They began living like they were lost, like they were pagans. What was the result? Well, 1 Corinthians 3.15. If anyone's work is burned, Paul said, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Jesus Christ wrote a letter to the church on earth. After two generations, this set of churches had more letters written to them than any other church, more truth trained to them. And yet these churches allowed the Holy Spirit to be grieved and quenched, and they suffered loss, and they got to heaven empty-handed. I wonder, do you think every day about the greatest day of your life? It's the day that you stand in front of Jesus Christ and you get to say, this is my life. This is what I did for you on earth. Everything else was just, you know, food and raiment and I was content. But this is my service, my offering to you. When you get invited to the reception of the greatest person in your life, what present are you going to give them? Are you going to get there empty-handed? That's a choice you make today. And it starts with putting off, being renewed, letting the Word of God restart your mind thinking God's way, and then choosing to put on God's way. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father in heaven, I thank you for these three churches. What a sobering lesson. Thank you for illustrating the empty entrance into heaven that Samson had, but he was saved, like Lot, like many New Testament believers, but so as by fire. Lord, speak to our hearts, convict us, and draw us to take your grace and begin putting off the old ways and being renewed every day by getting into your word and then putting on the new creation we are in Christ as the justifying death of you, Lord Jesus, opens for us your sanctifying life. That's what we want. In the precious name of Jesus, we ask for it. And all God's people said, amen.